Good evening. Now that Michael Stone has been convicted of the murder of Megan and Lynn Russell and the savage attack on Josie, we can tell you more about what led to his arrest. It was Crime Watch's second appeal on the case, the first to produce new witnesses, but frankly by now the inquiry had almost run into the ground. So this time we pieced together all the clues about the killer's habits and specifically we appealed for psychiatrists or anyone who might recognize the patterns of behavior. One psychiatrist called in, startled by the similarities with a former patient. The name he gave, Michael Stone, was new to the inquiry and immediately caused a flurry of interest. Stone had been seen with blood on his shirt and had burned his clothing from that day but couldn't explain why. He knew the remote area where the killings had taken place. He had an appalling history of psychopathic violence and specifically attacks with hammers. On an idyllic summer afternoon, he destroyed a happy family of the sort he'd never had himself. Well, the Russell case follows many other shocking crimes solved with help from Crime Watch viewers. So let's see if we can do it again tonight with another case that's made headline news. That is the murder in Cornwall three weeks ago today of Linda Bryant. As you may have seen, Linda's death might be linked with the stabbing last year of Kate Bushell, the schoolgirl ambushed while walking a dog in Devon. Linda too had been out walking her dog and it was her abandoned lurcher that drew attention. Skibiramak in the newsroom. A massive police investigation is underway after the discovery of a woman's body in a field on the Roseland Peninsula. Jack Enright reports. The dead woman's body was found by a holiday maker at Roman High Lanes at around 20 to 3 this afternoon. She phoned police who have now surrounded the area around the village, which lies around five miles south of Truro. Officers say the woman had a number of stab wounds on her body. My first idea that something might have been wrong was when I saw a lot of police vans go down the same road that she walked down. And I was very, very shaky. Two policemen got out of the car and came to the door and told me that Mum had been found dead. Come on, sweetheart. Another day, another dollar. <sighs> Why can't it be another day, another million dollars? That's what I want to know. Wouldn't mind getting up for work then. I think Lee would have been killing around today. It hasn't said. Anyway, you've just seen him, Mum. Can't see enough of him, you know that. This grandchild's always special. She absolutely adores her grandson. She was looking forward to him starting to walk and talking. If I hadn't have gone to work that day, if I'd been able to spend it with Mum, I would have told her that I loved her, because we don't say that to each other very often. Around lunchtime that day, a local woman noticed a stranger walking near Ruin High Lanes on the road from Truro to St Moors. So as I approached him, he sort of turned around and looked at me and just looked odd. Three weeks ago, could this have been you? Five foot ten, early thirties, short hair, square jawed, dark eyebrows. When he looked at me, I just remember thinking, I wouldn't pick you up even if you were hitchhiking. I knew Linda quite well. I used to go to school with her. Uh, she didn't use the garage all that regular. I believe at the time it was about one o'clock-ish. Thanks, love. Thank you. I was late paying my petrol bill, so I drove in, and Lynn was just getting into her car there, and I went over to her, and, you know, that week I hadn't seen her for about three or four months, I suppose. Hi, Linda. How are you doing? Oh! Baby seat in the back, I see. Is there something you're trying to tell me? Very funny, Iris. Only kidding. You don't look old enough to be a grandmother. That's why I keep forgetting. <laughs> then I was aware of a van coming in, and I thought that I, because I, I parked at such an awkward angle, that he couldn't get to the diesel pump to fill up. You say that's 
say the sweetest things, Iris. But listen, I've got a dash. I'll talk to you later, though, okay? Sure. Better move myself. Be swearing at me soon, him, if I don't let him into the pumps. He was about 50 years old, with a round face and a full, bushy brown beard flecked with grey. He appeared to be quite big and seemed to be wearing a waxed green jacket. But he didn't look at me. His eyes were looking towards the road or Lynn's car. And I thought, hmm, funny thing. And I remember it, because it slowly reversed back towards me here and followed uh, the Sierra down the road, yeah. Very, like, calculated. Take Jay for her walk. Well, she never wanted to celebrate her birthday because she never wanted to get older. Okay, it seems like they come around quicker every year. Okay, Jay, let's stretch these legs of yours. Come on, girl. Come on. Won't be long. Okay, bye. Jay was a rescue dog and Mum loved her to bits. This is a route which Linda Bryant took almost every day. Were you in Ruin High Lanes on Tuesday, three weeks ago, where Linda walked down towards the Methodist Chapel and then left towards Trawaga? I've done that walk with her quite a few times. Usually she forced me. <laughs> but now I'd do anything to walk around there with her again. And were you walking round there at roughly two o'clock that Tuesday afternoon? Was this you meeting Linda with her lurcher on the crossroads near the chapel? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. At two o'clock I went up to get the cows out of the field. There was nothing in the road, nothing opposite. There was, no, there was no body there. I've seen her walking her dog, and I know she lives local. I only know her as Linda, as all. At first I thought, no, they're lying. But and it just dawned on me that they weren't. Night times is the worst. Through the daytime, there's usually at least one police and then, then at night time when everybody's gone home, you're just sort of left to sit and think. It's a very strange feeling not having mum there because sometimes you just think that she's up in the other room or she's gone somewhere and you don't know when she's coming back. Well, Chris Borland, this case has attracted a huge amount of uh, publicity nationally, appalled everyone who's heard about it. Who are you appealing to tonight? Well, Linda Bryant's killer is clearly a dangerous and violent man who has to be caught. <coughs> My main appeal is to someone watching who perhaps either knows the killer or has suspicions about someone they live with or work with or live near to. Secondly, I'd like to hear from professional people, people perhaps doctors or psychiatrists, who have or have had a patient that they think is probably capable of this violent crime. Well, that plea certainly worked in the Michael Stone case. Now, ironically, it's the uh, anniversary, the year's anniversary this weekend of the, the murder of Kate Bushell, and the two have been linked. Do you believe seriously that there are links between the two cases? There are distinct possibilities that they are linked, and we're working closely with the Kate Bushell inquiry team, but I would stress that this also could be local in character. Now, you have said, as we saw in the film, that there are a number of people you want to identify, particularly the man in that maestro van, and I think you've got a bit more information since, uh, since that film, haven't you? Yes, we've had two important sightings on the Friday and the Saturday before Linda's death. <coughs> Most important was a sighting on Saturday the 17th of October when the van was seen in the lay-by near to the Methodist church, very close to where her body was found. And what about the other two? We saw a number of uh, another, two other men in the film, but there are two that we didn't see who you'd like to eliminate as well, two other sightings of, of strangers, perhaps. Yes, one was a man walking across a field in light clothing at about 3 o'clock, away from the A3078, and we know that that's particularly unusual. Now, 
Her glasses went missing. You haven't found her glasses? No, the glasses that were used in the reconstruction are identical to the ones that Linda wore on the day. They've not been found, so I'd like to hear from anyone who has any information about those. What would you say to someone who is at home, who has an inkling, but who is afraid to call in? Linda's family and the community around Roseland have been devastated by this crime. It's important we hear from anybody who's got any, inf any information at all. It's equally important that they don't just focus on the white van and the descriptions we've given, but on anyone that raises suspicions. We need to hear from them for any reason at all. The man in the white van, do you believe that he is a strong suspect? I think he is. He doesn't appear to be local, but if he isn't, we need him to come forward so we can eliminate him from the inquiry and we can concentrate on more important matters. Chris Borland, thank you very much indeed. Well, please don't hesitate if you can help in any way. 0500 600 600 is our free call number to the studio. There are many detectives here and other officers are waiting on 01392 451 004. That's Exeter 451 004. 18 months ago, there was a violent robbery at a pub in Welling, Hertfordshire. One of the robbers threatened victims with a sawn-off shotgun, and we're now keen to talk to this man, Stephen Barry Fox. He's 29, 5 foot 10, medium build, with a tattoo of a swallow on his neck and a noticeable three-inch scar on his left cheek. 0500 600 600, or call the incident room on 01707 638 166. That's Potter's Bar, 638 166. One six six, and there is a reward for a conviction in this case. Or have you seen this man? After a drugs operation, David Patrick Statham was arrested at his home in Rochdale. But before he could be interviewed, he jumped from a first floor landing and ran off. These pictures were taken in Rochdale, but where is he now? As you can see, he used to have a black BMW, and David Statham uses lots of different names. He's 36, 5 foot 10, well built with receding hair and such a prominent nose that he's sometimes called the beak. He wears jewellery and designer clothes and is an avid squash player and a gambler. Our free call number is 0500 600 600 and the incident room on 01257 246 510. That's Chorley 246 510. Since the end of 1994 there's been a series of sex attacks on children all of the North East London Essex borders with one of the parents explaining the grief and the bewilderment experienced by so many families, our reconstruction speaks for itself. What we have to do tonight is find the offender. Every time there is someone whose child is attacked by this man, it all comes back. We know what the families are going through. I just don't want any more lives ruined. The first reported case was in November 1994. A 14 year old was crossing Woodford Public Golf Course on her way to an extra lesson after school. If you make any noise, I'll stab you. Where are you going? Well, this way, I'm going home. That's a stupid way to go. Come with me. She was marched a hundred yards into the undergrowth where she was seriously sexually assaulted. The knife man was probably in his twenties. He seemed average height and had ginger hair. Wait here for five minutes. I'll be watching you. The next case linked in public tonight for the first time was five months later, in April 1995. This is 13 miles from the last attack. It's near the Hornchurch Cardrome. We always knew where he was. He wasn't on the streets or anything like that. He was always going somewhere. So, as parents, we thought that we was protecting him enough, but also giving him independence. And it was all working out very well. I was going down past the Cardrome and turning right into the lane. All of a sudden, as I crossed into the lane, the beginning of the lane, a man stepped out in front of the car. The hair, it was very distinctive. It was a strawberry blonde ginger. It wasn't a proper ginger. It was a, a very distinctive colour. There's not that many people that you see that colour. 
stood there for a good few seconds and then turned round and started walking around to the passenger side as if he was coming in to get into the car. I just sort of swerved the car around him and off I went. I have an incredibly brave child who's not a child anymore. I'm proud to say it's mine. Come with me, or I'll kill you. Children are just so wonderfully innocent. They see life as black and white, and you can think back when you was a child. It's, you just cannot imagine something so awful, and he was just a little boy. The 11-year-old was raped, and when the man ran off, the boy instinctively ran in the opposite direction. He tumbled straight into a river. He was soaking wet, in shock. What hurts me the most is that he sat for hours in boots that were filled with water, and he didn't even tell me. I had to bath him. He was too traumatised to do anything for himself, and I told him that I was going to wash this man out of his body. Then he'd be my little boy again. That evening, he just laid there like a frightened animal, staring at everybody. I was just so frightened, so shocked, disbelief. Just couldn't believe that someone could do that. And we looked after him so well. The third linked attack was in June this year in Clayhall, near Ilford, and the victims were younger still. He seems to have it planned well in advance, um, where he's going to spring his attacks. I'm sure that he does know the areas that he's operating in. And it's not just children um, that are, are left to roam the streets. These are children from well-cared-for, responsible, loved families. I got a new dog yesterday. Where'd you get it? The shop around the corner. Yeah. That shop sells those lollipops, which are really nice. Yeah. Hiya. Do you like climbing trees? Yeah. Do you want me to take to see some better trees? I know a little tree that we can climb. OK. The girls felt he was um, a nice man. He seemed friendly, not threatening. And I think that's why the girls went with him in the first place. What's your names? Ah, oh, right. They're nice names. I just took the dog for a walk up the forest there. We don't walk very far. We can't. A pair of us. We're all getting old. We just walk round by the allotments. About 100 yards before the opening, I see two little girls in front of me. The dog ran up to them and they patted him. I just thought he was a father taking his two kids for a walk through the forest. It's nothing out of ordinary, you know what I mean? It's possible these were two different girls. Were you out cycling with your daughters in Clay Hall on a Monday afternoon in June? Only over there. Come on. It's when they got to the adjacent woods with Claybury Hospital that the girls realised that they really had gone too far. That White House over there, that's the mental hospital, isn't it? No, that's not the hospital. That's it. That's where people get killed. It's a type of a confidence trick. There's something over there. Just over there. No, we've gone too far now. Can we go home now? Yeah, sure. Come on, this way. Now, I've done you a favour. Can you do me a favour? Come on. The girls obviously felt obliged to do what he asked them to do. It was, it was again, a manipulative thing. I'm pretty sure the girls were, were completely terrified. But I don't think they were in any position to offer any resistance. They were alone in such a horrific um, assault. This time, the man forced oral sex upon both his little victims. To get home from here, you go straight on and then right. What he actually did to the girls was to strip them of their innocence. They went in there, two nine-year-old girls, and it's something that I'm sure they'll never forget for the, the rest of their lives. 
The attacker, or perhaps it was another cyclist, was seen pedaling back up Pancake Hill. You crush yourself because you're so frightened that your child is going to grow up into an adult that's going to be so screwed up through what's happened to him. And I wished it had been me and not him. I just wished it had been me. Paul Brown, it's so distressing. This. Who specifically are you appealing to? Care workers, principally. We do believe this man has spent some time in care or some form of institution. We've got a, a second artist's impression, this one done by one of, the, one of the victims, one of the children. Tell us about his physical appearance. He's ginger-haired, and we've had that all the way through the descriptions. Five foot six to five foot ten. He's clean and cared for, clean appearance. He speaks quite slowly, which may indicate possibly some form of educational problem. Actually, what do you know about his behaviour? Because, of course, if he was in care, people, he might be now ten years or fifteen years after he left care, even more. Tell us about his behaviour style. From psychological profiling and research that we've done, we sus suspect he's unable to sustain a relationship. He may try to create relationships but fail. Uh, we suspect he is homosexual, but he will try and portray himself as heterosexual. Um, if he's in employment, we think it will be sort of the lower grade employment where he's going to be the assistant rather than the organiser. Will he, will he be attracted to children? Will he work with children? Yes, it's suspected that he will orientate himself towards working with them or at least be in association with them. Will he work at all? Because these offences all took place in weekdays between 12 o'clock and, and midday, that is, and, and, and 4 p.m. So he might be able to work or he may flexible be able, work. He may be able to work, maybe flexible, or it could be that he's in voluntary work where he works strange hours. Now, if people have got suspicions, you've got DNA, so it's very, very quick and easy to eliminate people. Yes, it is. You're really frightened this man could strike again. I've got to be there. These are horrible offences. I'm deeply concerned about it. And I desperately want to catch this man. Well, if there's any way you can help, 0500 600 600, strawberry, blonde and ginger. Remember, that's the most distinctive feature. Several detectives on the case are here. And the combined incident room is at Ilford in Essex on 0181 345 2696. That's 0181 345 2696. Five of last month's appeals have made important progress after calls from viewers. They include GBH, arson, theft and a charge of robbery and kidnap. One was a woman arrested an hour after we came off air. She was wanted after a child was hideously injured. Another was the appalling petrol bombing of a nightclub in Doncaster. Strong results on last month's reconstructions too, but the most dramatic outcome may have come about by chance, and we'll tell you more about that when we can. On the Samantha Class inquiry, Samantha, you may remember, was the prostitute found dumped in the River Humber. Six people gave the same name and a man not known to the inquiry. And there's a rather unexpected outcome from a reconstruction we showed in September in Crime Watch Still Unsolved. It was a rape in Blackburn, Lancashire in October 1995. The rapist evidently saw the programme and the police are confident that it was he who wrote this letter addressed to Blackburn Police. He says he's sorry, he knows that he has a problem and he wants to give himself up. Well, if he does, it's certainly better than waiting to be caught. And if it's you, and you really do need, please, to call this number, 01254 353535. That's Blackburn, 353 535. Earlier this year, a 13-year-old child was sexually assaulted, and ever since then, we've been keen to talk to this man, Michael John Prosser. We know he went with his wife to Tenerife in March, but she returned alone, and he hasn't been seen since. He may be in London or perhaps Lancashire. Michael Prosser is 58, 5'5", five five, thin and balding, with a Birmingham accent. This is an unpleasant case, so please do call 0500 600 600, or you can ring the incident room on 0156. 628208888. That's Kidderminster 820888. And another unpleasant crime where this man, Peter Clark, may be able to help with inquiries. Six months ago, a man in Hampshire was stabbed in the chest three times and hit over the head with a bottle. The victim was lucky the injuries weren't fatal. Peter Clark is five foot ten, thin built, with a Southampton accent. If you've seen him in Birmingham, the West Country, or indeed anywhere else, please ring us without delay. He may be violent. 0500 600 600 or the local police direct on 01703 674 383. That's Southampton, 674383. A year ago, Gracia Morton left her home in Kensington, actually Notting Hill in West London, and disappeared. We know her five-year-old daughter was dropped off at school. Her former husband says she came round to see him. They had a row, but no one's seen Gracia since. 
We appealed on this case at the beginning of the year, but now on the anniversary of her disappearance, we're asking for your help again. This is the last that we definitely know about Gracia's movements. It's a video in the hallway of her flat as she left on Wednesday, the 12th of November last year. And this is her husband's home in St Anne's Road, off Royal Crescent, near the Kensington Hilton Hotel. But what happened to Gracia after she left here? This is Gracia's sister, Constanza, and this is the investigating officer, D.I. Rick Turner. Constanza, it's appalling this for you and the family. What, what do you, what does the family think happened? We all think she's dead. Uh, we know the police have to keep an open mind in these things, but certainly all who knew her well believe she's dead, murdered. Rick, you have to keep an open mind, but if she has been murdered, how can viewers help? Obviously, around this area of Notting Hill, near Kensington Hilton, if she was murdered, somebody might have seen something in the street. Yes, uh, anybody who's seen uh, Gracia in and around the address in St Anne's Road, West 11, uh, on that morning of the 12th of November. Last year. Though. Last year. Um, or in fact, if she has been abducted in that area, then clearly she's got to re re be removed from that area. So anybody who's seen anything suspicious uh, with a car or any parcel, somebody wrapped up, we would be, we would obviously wish to know. People, somebody wrapped up in a carpet or something like that? Any sort of material, but yes, a carpet. Quite apart from this Notting Hill area, where else might she have gone? Uh, she did have access to a cottage in Stonesfield near Woodstock in Oxfordshire. Um, and obviously that's a route there from the, from the A40 and the M40 to Oxfordshire. Um, anybody who's seen anybody acting suspiciously around this time uh, on, on that route. Constanza, appalling for you. How, how is her daughter doing? How, how are the rest of surviving? Well, she's lost her mother, so obviously, um, you know, you can't exaggerate the, the magnitude of the loss. And all the adults are obviously still very upset and very frustrated and very distressed. If someone can help tonight, it's going to mean an awful lot to you. It would mean a lot to us and certainly to Celeste. Um, because not only now, but also when she grows up, she understands her mother didn't abandon her. Well, <laughs> even if it seems a very, very long shot, please give us a call. We have video of Gracia that hasn't been shown in public before. Did you know her? If so, have you any ideas or any suspicions? Did you see her any time around this time last year? And above all, might you have seen her on that morning of Wednesday, the 12th of November last year? If you've any clues at all, to her child and family a favour, 0500 600 600, or call the police direct on 0181 246 0731. That's 0181 246 0731. Well, you've been active on the phones so far this evening, particularly on the Linda Bryant murder. We've had more than 60 calls. A third of those calls have given names of potential suspects, but not one name has been mentioned twice, so the police have quite a lot to go on there. Um, Stephen Barry Fox, we've had three calls about him, and uh, David Statham, two calls. Only one call so far on those Ilford sex attacks, and one name has been put forward in that call to keep those calls coming in. Now, if you've ever had your car broken into, you'll be keen to see these two arrested. After a spate of car crime in Pudsey near Leeds, police set up a surveillance camera, and in the next few minutes, this pair tried to break into three vehicles, causing extensive damage, but they couldn't get them started. By the time backup arrived, the two of them were off. Well, they're pretty identifiable. They're in their early 20s. The shorter one has mousy hair. The other one is dark. So do everyone a favor and give us a call 0500 600 600 or 0800 405 040. That's free phone 0800 405 040. Just over three months ago in Orpington in Kent, there was a terrible attack on a woman in front of her young child. Two men were involved but the motive is simply unknown. All detectives can imagine is that it was a case of mistaken identity. Jack. Stop it. When you brought in the car, you go, boom, boom, boom. I get all going on. Myself and my friend were outside um, photographing my car before I sold it. Oh, do you think you can move? Your face is going to put people off oh, the car. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Jack. You really think I'm going to get 500 quid for this? If you're lucky. And then these couple of guys came up the street, a black guy and a white guy. For some weird reason, I don't know why, I just got it into my mind to take note of what they were doing in that. 
they seemed to be rather cautious and they seemed to be looking about to see, you know, what was going on. Here, you're in your pyjamas already? That was quick. Here, go and have a quick wash here before the tent. Yeah? Is he in? He had really, really strong, big eyes. He was medium built, very smart. I'd say he was about 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, he was between 30 to 32. Ooh. Oh, my God! Get out! Sometimes I think back, I could have done something to him because I was so close to him. But it was my scream, it did frighten him, and that's why he ran. I had the camera in my hand and I thought, do I take a picture, don't I? If I had taken a picture, they'd have turned on both myself and my friend. Lima 488, adult female stabbing, Bartimir Road, Orpington. Origin 2050, to you at 2055. I was very lucky, if it would have been a fraction deeper, it would have gone to my jugular vein and I might not have survived. I can't understand why anyone's going to hurt me. And I keep, keep saying over and over in my mind and I can't come up with any answers. There must have been a motive, it wasn't random. And if it was mistaken identity, who was the intended victim? If you have any idea who this might be, Here's the number, 0500 600 600. And incidentally, note the tracksuit trousers. One witness thinks that there were two yellow stripes down them, not the usual three you get with most in this style. You can call the incident room if you prefer 0181 284 8012. That's 0181 284 8012. From Bristol to Surrey to London, a man's been trying to pass forged cheques, and often quite big ones. Here he is, looking very smart and pretending he's a company director. He's six foot tall with broad shoulders and balding, mousy hair. Remember him, watch out for him, and if you know where he is tonight, please ring now 0500 600 600 or the local police on 01883 344 789. That's Caterham in Surrey, 344 789. If you're in residential care, you'd expect to get just that, care. But maybe this man thinks otherwise. He was deputy manager of a home for people suffering from severe learning difficulties who relied on staff like him. After he disappeared, it was discovered that £6,000 had gone missing from a resident's savings. Richard David Reed may have an explanation for what happened. If so, we'd like to hear it. He's fairly distinctive, 20 stone, 5 foot 10, and sports rings on his fingers and ears. He frequents gay bars. He may have tried to find employment in another care home and may still have a Renault 11 TXE registration C780SJU. If you've come across it or him, give us a call on 0500 600 600 or the incident room on 01536 411 411. That's Kettering 411 411. Now, we've had some calls asking to see images of the driver of the white Maestro van in the Linda Bryant case. People wanted to see that again. Well, here they are. They're two different images, but police believe, they're just coming up now, police believe that, uh, that they are of the same man. So there we are. Now, Crime Watch viewers have astonishingly long memories, but how good are you at thinking back to 1984, 14 years ago? Well, new advances in DNA techniques have provided a breakthrough in several investigations into rape. Seven could be linked. A new inquiry team, Operation Quicksilver, has been brought together, and this simple test can quickly identify the culprit. All it needs is a tiny sample taken from the mouth with a little swab like this. There, it's painless. You just brush the inside of the mouth it takes a couple of seconds and it can just as easily eliminate innocent people so if anything strikes a chord please ring us straight away the attacks took place in Milton Keynes Reading and Leamington Spa but the first five were in Northampton a friend and I had, had an argument so I wasn't in a very good mood I was a bit upset um, so it took me a while to get to sleep I heard what I thought to be my flatmate come in. There's lots of rustling around downstairs. 
Well, when I thought to be home, went into the sundry. Sensed somebody was by the bedroom door, so I sort of buried myself in the covers a bit more because I didn't want to speak to her. And then, then I did look round and notice there's a man standing there. I think I just froze. I don't remember his face. The street light was on and it's just outside the bedroom window, so the, the light was catching on the knife and making it shine. He kept calling me by my flatmate's name. I don't know if he really thought that I was her or, or had just seen things in the house. He kept saying things like, I know what school your son goes to. Some of the time I was wondering if he'd killed my son. I thought he was going to kill me. Part of the way through, hoped that he would. I was angry with myself because I couldn't move, couldn't defend myself. It stopped me um, coming back to a place where I had lots of friends. I, I think for a long time I wasn't there for my son either. I couldn't accept um, affection from him or anyone really for a long time. In fact, this was the third in a series, all in Northampton, all in similar terraced houses, all with access through adjoining gardens. A composite picture was now emerging of the suspect. He's black, was then in his mid-teens, sexually inexperienced, was always armed and often agitated. But six months later, by October 1986, he'd grown more confident. He stayed and seemed to want to befriend his victim after the attack. The moment I actually realised something was wrong was basically when the hallway lights switched off. Even though he said sorry, it was like a false child's put-on cry, something to start the conversation, perhaps. He said that he'd seen me around and he liked me, but he didn't think I'd go out with him. And he wanted to know if I did have his child, would I get rid of it? Obviously, whilst he was talking, I was quite safe. He wasn't much taller than me, about nine and a half stone. The eyes were reasonably close together. The ears were small. His jaw wasn't square. It was more an overly round face. Then another six months later, less than a mile away, presumably the same man. I was dreaming, I mean, in my dream. It was as if the light went on in the bedroom and it made me wake up from the dream, but as I opened my eyes, it was completely dark and then his hands went round my throat. And I knew if I carried on struggling, I knew he'd kill me. So you stop struggling and you just do what you, what you can uh, to save your own life. I thought, I don't want to die. Again, a bizarre conversation, as though this was a normal relationship. He talked about football, and he even arranged at one point to meet me um, because I, I was chatting away to him afterwards because I thought, if he likes me, he won't want to kill me. And I suppose my impression of him was that he was very dominated by females and he wanted to be the dominant one. Northamptonshire police set up an incident room and a large-scale investigation began. Sixty extra uniformed police patrolled the streets at night. But the suspect seemed to disappear. Did the police operation drive him into hiding? Were later victims too scared to report him? Or had he left Northampton? We now know he began to change the focus of his attacks. Two years later, in the same type of terraced house, there was one in Milton Keynes. Then Reading. Then in Leamington Spa. What was the connection between these towns? And if he stopped in 1990, why? Is he in prison? Is he in a relationship? Or has he now moved somewhere else? I think I just would like to ask him why and to tell him how it's affected my life. He probably thinks he's got away with it. And for all we know, he might decide to suddenly get up and do it again. Well, Detective Superintendent Cross, this is a difficult case. I mean, we are asking people to cast their mind back at least eight years. What could have happened in those intervening years between 1990 and now? Well, it's quite possible, as you've said in the film there, that he is in prison or he is in a relationship. Equally, it's possible that there are people out there who were his victims who haven't come forward for whatever reason. Um, I'd like them, if they could, to, uh, to look at that film, 
and take some strength from the courage that the victims that we've shown there. So these attacks happened a long time ago, as we've said. Why are you choosing to appeal now? It's only now that we've been able to link one of the four offences that happened in Northampton between 1984 and 1987 to the attacks in 1989 in Milton Keynes and 1990 in Reading and Leamington Spa. Um, and in case anybody thinks that's a long time ago, uh, we've got to remember what's happened to these women. Um, they've been attacked in their own homes. Uh, they've had to move away from those homes and away from their friends. And one of the victims has had to abort a child she conceived as a result of being raped in her own bedroom. Mm -hmm. So what characteristics would this man have now? I mean, he'd be older, obviously. What sort of age would he be? We're looking for a man, a black man now, who's in the 28 to 36 age group. We believe when he started attacking in Northampton in 1984, he would have been in his mid to late teens. We think he would have been a bit of a loner. Um, uh, you've already mentioned in the film the bizarre attempts to strike up relationships. Um, he was not sexually inexperienced because we know that he passed gonorrhea on to two of his victims and in fact to the first victim in 1984. And somebody might recall uh, an individual who's fitting this profile that went for treatment. And what do you make of the pattern and the geography of his attacks, the fact that he moved away from Northampton? Yes, we believe he was, a, as I say, a, a young te a teenager in the... Uh, period 84 to 87. I believe he's then moved on to uh, Milton Keynes, Reading and Leamington Spa and I'm hoping that uh, perhaps an employer will, will look at that and it might jog their memory. It might form a, a pattern of uh, delivery for a particular firm. And briefly, there is a reward on offer, isn't there? There is a reward of £5,000. I'm hoping that people will ring in and be motivated to ring in by what they've seen already. But if there is anybody out there that actually knows the individual, I'm hoping to reach out to them with that reward of £5,000. Chris Cross, thank you very much indeed. Well, I know it's a long time ago, but if you do remember anything or can help in any way, call the incident room on 0808 100 3131. That's free phone, 0808 100 3131. Or call us here in the studio on 0500 600 600. And that's the number for any of our cases tonight. The lines are open until midnight. And you'll find other numbers listed under CFAX on page 621. If you're a victim of crime, then support line numbers are also on CFAX. You can email us at crimewatchuk at bbc, or more precisely, cwuk at bbc.co.uk. And if you've any information on a crime, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously, if you prefer, on 0800 555 1. So join us for next month's Crime Watch on Tuesday, December the 15th. In fact, we'll be back with Crime Watch Update at 20 to 12, and if that's beyond your bedtime, you might like to reflect on these two headlines. Police figures for sex crime did, in fact, go up very slightly last year, but probably because people now report attacks used to keep to themselves, crimes like date rape and domestic violence. Victim surveys actually show a big drop in sex offences, and, in fact, overall crime, however measured, is indeed seeing its biggest fall since the 1950s. So don't, certainly on our account of nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.